adverse effects of the drought and drought operations and our conclusion that the potential effects of the types of operations proposed in the interim contingency plan were considered in the underlying analysis of the opinion. So that's what we're concurring on. We weren't necessarily concurring, like I said, I'm not opposed to water exports, but we're not concurring um, for, uh, for the operators to just continue exports or that we're okay with the continued degradation of the delta and everything else anybody can dream up. The concurrence is that it fits within the drought operations, procedures, and our, and our biological opinion. Uh, I think that's all I have. Understood. Oh, maybe not. So what does this mean for uh, this coming year? Um, so we heard forecasts of uh, what this sets up to be the fourth year of drought, and what are we going to do with uh, Shasta and Winter Run? Uh, so the February forecast uh, may be coming soon from Reclamation, and We'll find out what it says at a 50 and 90 percent exceedance forecast uh, end of September carryover, carryover storage and also um, a projected temperature, temperature compliance point for winter run. Uh, one of the issues, as we acknowledged last year, was the temperature modeling, uh, what it did and what it didn't do. So I think one of the lessons learned, aside from big changes to reclamation's temperature modeling, is to look at the graphs and not assume that that's going to be reality. Um, and it will be a work in progress in coordination with the board um, as far as the March deadlines to do, to do the look back and also the temperature management plan. Uh, we heard storage and snowpack doesn't look very promising and uh, skipping down to a winter run contingency plan, we had one in our drought contingency plan from April 8th. Um, dire situation, dire consequences, so we have drastic measures that we put into this winter run contingency plan. Uh, which I mentioned up to 400 brood stock at Livingston Stone National Fish Hatchery. Um, that in 2014 I consider a band-aid. Uh, everything indicates that we can't just continue ha producing hatchery fish. Uh, 2015 that might be another band-aid, uh, but pretty soon we're going to have to take a look at drought or the hydrology as the new normal, as I heard earlier. So what are we going to do about it? And that's something that we're going to have to take a hard look at for 2015. Um, our science center supported moving uh, as much as the 60% of the eggs and the, and the um, juveniles into the hatchery or the production of those as a band-aid and a contingency. I don't know if they had the forward thinking of how many years mm -hmm. of this are we going to, in quotes, allow before the genetics and, and other things, the inadvertent um, consequences with this kind of ac um, operation is going to start um, imposing on the viability of winter run. Would it have been better out to just maintain the 5% survival in, in nature? Those are questions that we're struggling with right now, mm -hmm. thinking about. Wilkins slew requirements, I had an S in there because there's multiple requirements, uh, one of which is, um, I'm calling it antiquated, but there's, an, uh, there's a core Navigational requirement to maintain 5,000 CFS at Wilkins Slough. Um, as I understand, it's antiquated. Um, uh, operationally, Reclamation continues to try to maintain that 5,000, um, but it's not really imposed through the Corps. I'm saying that. I don't know if the Corps is here yeah. listening in to, to have feedback on that. Um, so there's this 5,000 uh, Wilkins Slough requirement through the Corps. In our part of our drought contingency planning, I mentioned action 123C, we require different things, one of which is no greater than 4,000 CFS at Wilkins Slough. Oh. So that's another requirement. And then we also have a third requirement, and that's action 1.4 in our biological opinion that requires the Sac River Temperature Task Group to take a look at the Wilkins Slough requirements and see what fish need. They might need 5,000, they might need two, so what do fish need as far as a minimum requirement for that particular uh, point in the river. So that's something that we could look at for this year. Um, Ron mentioned coordination with the SAC settlement contractors delaying their flood up to save some water. So hopefully we're going to um, coordinate with uh, GCID and other SAC settlement contractors to work with us on that. And then I mentioned temperature modeling. Um, and there's efforts associated with our uh, science center to do additional temp temperature modeling or have a different temperature model to hopefully have better accurate forecast of what we have and, and uh, how to operate the system. Thank you.
Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Any questions now, or we can wait until all three? You lost your little muffler, whatever that is. Janine says it's very important that I have this on here. So. Yeah. Uh, th this is actually for all three, and uh, I'm assuming that you have to make that you have that there, you have internally uh, some criteria or some uh, for findings that you would uh, be making uh, uh, in terms of um, unreasonable impacts on fish and wildlife. I mean that you'd be. You, I assume you do have criteria for those findings. Is that correct? Anyway. I guess the question is, are you looking, it's a different, their standard's a different standard than ours. Right. And, and it would be help. I guess what I'm saying is, if you don't have them, I, you know, that's one thing. But if you do have criteria that, uh, that allow you to make findings that there has been some unreasonable action taken to affect fish and wildlife, that's something that we really need in order to make our decisions even though they're different, uh, we, we have different criteria. I mean, we have balancing uh, criteria that you don't have. Mm -hmm. And so I, really from all of you if, you, if you have those findings and can share them with us, that would be very helpful. It would be very helpful to know when the a T, uh, a TUCP request has, got, you know, it fits within the dry year or within the drought contingency plan, but when is it going to tip over into an unreasonable effect on fish and wildlife? And that's, that's kind of the question that I hear people asking. And so uh, if, you, if you can make a distinction between those uh, at some point, you don't have to do it right now, but uh, it, that would be very helpful. All right. And I'm going to want to hear a little more about your thinking on the issue of those 5% that are in the delta and what it takes to protect them. I, what I heard you say, Ms. Drip, was that your other requirements, those old and middle river flows, fit within your ability to say they're not being jeopardized. That doesn't say that it protects them in any way, shape, or form. It protects them from some things. It may not protect them from others. So I'm just not totally understanding how you look at their survival. Well, I mentioned there's for the brood year 2014, 95% of those which are in the Delta right now. Um, and in fact, it's probably even more because through the Delta operations for some mines and sturgeon group, they've indicated um, as far as percentages go, a limited amount of stragglers that are still upstream. So it's close to 100% hmm. probably in the Delta. So 100% uh, of the 5%. 100% of the 5% that survive, yes. Yeah. So out of the 406,000. Okay. Um, well actually, it's the 125,000 that, 125, that we think are in the Delta. Um, so of those, we have the fallback that we think um, of two things. One is that the proposal, especially the mid-step, is still within the old and middle river flows that we anticipated in the biological opinion, even though they might be a little more negative than without the mid-step. It's still within the range of the analysis. And the other fallback that we have is that the fish density triggers are still in place. So if the difference between the 1,500 minimum health and safety exports and the proposed 3,500 mid-step exports, if the, the, if the additional 2,000 CFS of exports mm. results in pulling more fish, more of our listed species into the export facilities, depending on what the fish densities are, it could trigger an OMR action mm -hmm. where at least five days, the next five days operationally, Reclamation of DDRI would have to maintain no more negative than negative 3,500. So that's some of the fallback that I was talking about. And so is that, I'm just trying to understand, and, and maybe I'm also trying to help people understand who are trying to understand, um, which is a part of our job too, challenging as it is. Um, so your standard, the OMR standard, is it protects against entrainment. I, is it also a surrogate in your mind for the estuarine health issues that were talked about earlier, which go beyond salmon, but that entire food web, avoiding invasives, all of the things that the D1641 went through, all of those 
agonizing hearings and challenge over time. I mean, again, this is one of the things I think people don't understand, and I'd love to illuminate in this as we figure out what to do here, which is you were looking at avoiding je jeopardy, meeting your biological opinion, which is a slightly different look than what we're charged with doing. So I'm trying to figure out whether you feel that your OMR safeguards adequately protect the fish, or you're just looking at your OMR safeguards because that's what you're supposed to do in a concurrence. Well, with uh, 15 seconds seconds to think about it, I don't think that our analysis for the listed species serves as a surrogate for the larger ecosystem and D1641. And I say that because right next to me is somebody who's going to talk about smelt, mm. and there's two listed species of right. smelt. We didn't consider smelt, not to mention prey and everything else associated with the ecosystem. But I started with the mid-step talking about D6341 as an assumed protection to begin with. Um, and there's probably adverse effects with the outflow associated with that D6341 and increased, OM increased more negative OMRs. But we didn't analyze the entirety of the whole list that Tom Howard mentioned earlier. Other questions, or can we, we'll move to U.S. Fish and Wildlife. I guess it's my turn. Um, Chair Marcus, members of the board, um, I'm assuming I'm going to end up answering some of the same questions Garwin did. Is this is this audible? Um, a, a number of things that I have had on my list of remarks to make today have already been made by others, and in the interest of time, I won't repeat those. Um, I, I would like to um, thank the board um, thank the board staff for their sober approach to addressing these issues, which seem to me to be very hard. Uh, the, the drought conditions that, that exist right now are, are having calamitous effects of both on people and on, on the ecosystem. Uh, and addressing these is really a hard thing to do. So I, I just want to express my appreciation for the wide brief that the board has to address in order to, to do that. Um, we, we, this same group of people has appeared in front of you a number of times over the last year, and I, I, I just want to hit some of the high points regarding uh, what, what's been happening with Delta smelt uh, and, uh, and include some remarks about this year's uh, operations and, and the TUCP and the uh, exchange of memos that occurred at the end of January. Um, Delta smelt, uh, in, since we um, have been working with drought operations plans, and I'm just going back to the beginning of 2014 in this discussion, um, have primarily presented uh, an entrainment risk issues. And last year, the entrainment risks for Delta smelt were as close to zero as they can be because the fish were uh, very advantageously distributed on the Sacramento River side of the estuary. So we, we never we, the Fish and Wildlife Service, never called for a, a change in operations. There were no determinations made during the year last year that, mm. that, that um, would have affected operations. Uh, and there were no um, other issues um, that arose last year that were related to operations. So it was a, it was a pretty quiet year on that front. Um, we, we did have to um, work together uh, with our um, partner agencies, uh, most of the people who are sitting in front of you, uh, to address uh, the question whether uh, various uh, flexibilities uh, and other measures that were implemented for drought purposes might have uh, effects on delta smelt, uh, and we were able to navigate that. Um, and to, to explain that, I'd, I'd like to get back to Board Member Spivey Weber's question about how we assess unreasonable effects to fish and wildlife. Mm. Um, that isn't really the standard that we look for. Uh, for, for us in implementing the ESA, the, the analysis is really focused on the consultative process. So when, for example, water operations were proposed to, to us in 2008 by reclamation, uh, we did a global analysis of the effects of those operations as a package on listed species, particularly delta smelt, the aquatic species that's at the center of this from our point of view. Uh, and we concluded that the originally proposed operations would jeopardize the species, and so in accordance with the normal practices, we, uh, we worked together with reclamation to develop a, a reasonable and prudent alternative to the originally proposed operations that would avoid jeopardizing the continued existence of delta smelt and avoid adverse modification of critical habitat. Those are 
the things that we need to do in the Endangered Species Act. Um, once that was done, uh, and all the time that's happened since then, since we haven't reconsulted on operations, all the issues that we've had to address have been have boiled down to questions whether a flexibility that was being proposed is within the range of effects originally analyzed for the project, and that expression comes up um, mm -hmm. more than, more often than not. Um, if the effects are within the range of effects originally analyzed for the project, then we normally can just write a concurrence. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we cannot generally do uh, a jeopardy analysis on the fly. It's, not the, 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 it's, it's too involved, it's too laborious, and it requires looking at the effects of the project as a whole and not looking simply at one little aspect of operations. For example, if, if there's an OMR flexibility requested, we, can, we can't do a a jeopardy analysis on that flexibility. So uh, we're, uh, we're, we're generally trying to fit the flexibilities into the, into the consultative context in which we originally wrote the opinions. Um, and that, that makes things uh, either easy or difficult depending on exactly what's being proposed. And so we've tried to work with our partner agencies to, to keep the uh, requested flexibilities within a comfort zone where we wouldn't feel like we were having to um, get, get outside of the original analysis that, that we prepared for the biological opinion. Does, does that suggest then that, I mean, b part of I think the challenge here is just that folks are talking about slightly different things. So you're looking at concurrence as you have described. We mm -hmm. have a charge to look at unreasonable effects. Is it unreasonable for us to be able to ask you to help us with assessing unreasonable effects, which I think is what Board Member Spivey Weber is asking. And since you mm -hmm. see the dynamic that happens about, well, the fish agencies agree it's not a problem, so what's your problem? The fact is the fish agencies were answering a different question than we're charged with answering that it puts us in this uh, very challenging situation where we can't throw our responsibilities away to say that your different doors somehow are e equivalent or better. I mean, in some ways, I, and I appreciated Director Cowan's comment earlier today about how we will all work together. I think last year there was more conversation. I'm not critiquing anyone. People could have been knocking on each other's doors. But it, you, you see the dynamic that makes it seem understandably confusing to people out in the world. So I, I guess what I'm saying is we'd, we'd love your help just as I think you'd love our help on things. Yeah, and I, I, that's a very good question. and. A couple of other people have said this. I think Mr. Howard said it this morning. Um, Garwin said it just a moment ago. And I will say it again, that we were, in fact, answering a different question uh, in our concurrence exchanges uh, from the one that Mr. Howard was addressing earlier, that, that um, our responsibilities have a much more narrow scope uh, in this enterprise uh, than the board's. But and can you put on an, uh, can you informally <laughs> or somehow come and, and help us as, you know, from your perspective, but address the issues that we have to, that we have to deal with. Otherwise, we're hanging out there. We are. I, and it's not right. I, I would be willing to offer a few comments in that regard as I, as I work my way through this. Um, huh. I imagine my colleagues are as well. Um, I, I, but I think it's important that, that people, particularly people who are watching this proceeding, know that we really did do something different in our concurrence mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from simply look at the TUCP request, consider the effects on, on the, the ecosystem as a whole, and respond on that basis because we didn't do that. And I, th I really appreciate where you're going with this. I think that would be very helpful. Um, however, um, the question of reasonableness, and I'm looking to Mr. Rother here. Um, I think we had one speaker talk about um, uh, the context of what we consider being the drought. Mm -hmm. So that should go into play. And then also, you know, what's reasonable now might not be reasonable in a different um, hyd hydrologic situation. But then also, um, we have a judgment call to make, mm -hmm. and that involves balancing. And so um, I think that your input would be uh, extremely helpful, but I'd get a little nervous about uh, the definition. I guess we'd have to go to Webster's here on unreasonableness. Y your definition of unreasonableness might be, we might have a different definition because we're supposed to be balancing. So just 
wanting to right. put that out there. Well, and through the course of the next few hours, because we're going to be here for a while, we'll hear all kinds of different views of what's reasonable um, or not than we've heard so far today, just by the nature of the card. So it's a very hard situation. So we're not asking you to do our job for us. I want to be clear about that, but we respect your opinion. And I yeah. would definitely concur in that. I'm not. Don't I'm use, use I'm that not, word. Use yes. a different <laughs> word. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm He's going to have to go back to Webster. Yes, I know. I know. Um, I'm, I'm not seeking. Uh, the fishery agency's determination of reasonableness. I will agree with mm -hmm. Board Member Dianamo. That's, mm -hmm. that's our decision to make for, for all of our sins. Um, <laughs> but in order to make that determination, we need to understand, you know, to the best of your abilities, what the impacts are to the fisheries. And I think that's, that's the gist of it. Mm -hmm. um, if you can provide, you know, or at least share your thoughts with respect to that outside of the initial charge that you were concurring with, that would be very helpful in our determination. But we're, we're mm -hmm. not, at least I'm not seeking for right. your determination of reasonableness. Understood, and I, I, I don't think we would have offered one, I think. We, mm -hmm. you know, you know, one of the things that we do is we provide technical advice mm -hmm. uh, to others who have to, who are, you know, have to make decisions of their own, uh, and I, this is one of those situations. Um, I will say that it's hard to give advice on such a big subject on the fly. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So uh, I'm going to be pretty well, cautious in what I say. Advice also during our standard setting process. So. Yeah. Um, so I want I, I you know I I started off by describing what we did in 2014. I left out um, a key component of that, which was hatchery operations that we did we undertook that were outside of the normal normal procedures for hatchery ops uh, because of the drought. Uh, we uh, trucked about 7.3 million uh, fall run Chinook smolts from the Coleman National Fish Hatchery when flow conditions weren't conducive to releasing them into the river directly um, last year. We uh, released about 4.5 million uh, smolts, uh, fall run smolts from the hatchery when in at different times when conditions were a little bit better. Um, we also, uh, Garwin described uh, work that we've been doing collaboratively, jointly on uh, winter run propagation at Livingston Stone National Fish Hatchery. This year we released 600,000 winter run smolts uh, recently uh, in a multi-agency effort. Um, we're expecting that we're going to address the issues of how to do hatchery releases um, as the year um, goes forward in more or less the same way we did last year. So. Uh, we are likely to face a lot of the same challenges. Um, we also have been uh, increasingly relying uh, for management purposes on some new uh, avenues of data collection. Um, one of those I've described previously, it was it's early warning monitoring. We've got real-time uh, trawl sampling going on on a daily basis uh, in the central delta that we're using to get uh, clues as to where uh, delta smelts and other fish are located. Uh, that's uh, now that that process has now been augmented uh, by some additional uh, turbidity measuring that uh, measurement that um, the Department of Water Resources is doing. Uh, they are uh, collecting some more uh, more uh, spatially detailed real time turbidity information, and together those um, sources of information are, are informing the operations decision process that Director Cowan described this morning. Um, We've also actually learned a number of new things, but this is probably not the time to talk about those. This is gonna yeah, also I'm conscious of all the people behind you. What, you yeah. you are, are very important to be heard from, and so we've gone long, but yeah. Yeah, and I, I'll, I'll try and speed it up. Um, so regarding the, the January TCP, um, again, I just to say again what, what Garwin did, we were looking strictly at Delta smelt because that is the species uh, that's involved in the consultation that we have with rec reclamation on operations. Um, and this year, uh, when we reviewed reclamation's uh, request, uh, we actually went a little bit beyond what we did last year. Last year, we were mostly concerned about entrainment, as I mm -hmm. mentioned. This year, uh, we are also looking at some new information that came from the Interagency Ecological Program uh, Management and Synthesis Team. Uh, which is, uh, there's a, a report produced by that group uh, that came out in the second half of January uh, 
that uh, offers a couple of hundred pages of, of analysis on delta smelt uh, flow and, uh, and flow issues and, uh, and other issues affecting delta smelt throughout their life cycle. I don't know if you had a chance to read the comments. There are comments addressing that report both ways, but some saying it's terrible, others saying it's great. Yeah. And we should pay attention to it. Um, and it's very early. This, this report has just come out, uh, so it's probably not that surprising that it's a bit of a Rorschach test and mm -hmm. people look at it the first time. Um, what it says actually is, is interesting, and it's something that we're going to be following up on. Uh, it's potentially important. Uh, it suggests that uh, there is an important out, potentially an important outflow abundance relationship or outflow recruitment relationship mm -hmm. for delta smelt in the winter and spring, uh, which is contrary to what we thought was the case uh, up until now. Uh, at least it's different from what's, what's been available in the literature up until now. Uh, it's pretty provocative. Um, we had a vigorous internal debate. We've talked to a lot of people about it. Um, and we, in our response to reclamation, requested that they help us expedite a review of that information uh, so that we can determine uh, really what it means, how it fits mm -hmm. in with uh, the body of information we already had available to us, uh, and what to do with it going forward. Um, one of the things that uh, is important to note about it is that the authors themselves described the results in the section, which was in a section at the near the end of the report called Recommendations for Future Work uh, in Management Applications, saying that the results uh, of the relevant uh, analysis are preliminary and included for illustrative purposes only. Peer-reviewed publication of these analyses need to be completed before they can be used to draw any conclusions. Um, we agree with that. Uh, we think the this information is important if it turns out to be uh, if it, all, it turns out to be accurate, it could potentially change our view of what uh, of what's relevant to delta smelt management during the winter and spring. It might not really be as much about uh, entrainment as it is about this other issue, whatever whatever's causing it. Uh, but again, we don't know. It's it's um, we we really need to do our homework on that, uh, and, and that's why we responded the way we did to Reclamation's request by commenting on it, but not acting on it. Uh, so. Um, Thank you. That's what a former Cal EPA secretary would say, important if true. Important if, absolutely right, but important if true, but potentially important if okay. true. That, in, thank you for the caution. Um, so what, one last comment. Um, the, the drought isn't just a fish issue. Uh, as you know, we and the, the state uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife run a, a, a system of refuges. Mm -hmm. uh, we have observed a lot of refuge effects. I've been uh, advised of a lot of re in detail of refuge effects that, that occurred last year as a result of the dry conditions and the absence of irrigation in some of the refuges. Um, we don't have time to talk about those today, uh, but we would like to talk to the board about those and bring in the refuge experts themselves uh, at the board's convenience uh, at a later time. So we'll be we prepared be to do that. More about this. Well, but do you agree that um, with the representatives from the Grasslands Water District that a uh, ramped um, or, or tiered uh, increase in exports uh, would assist the refuges south of Delta? I, I actually don't have the expertise to answer that because I don't know whether it would make a difference at the other end in terms of refuge deliveries. It's actually probably more a question for the operators. Okay. And that it, that's it for my comments if there Thank are no you. questions. No, thank you. That's helpful. We may have more. Hopefully you guys can stay late because there will be a lot of comments from the audience we may want to ask. Uh, Chair Marcus, board members, Carl Wilcox with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. I got it right this time. Uh, <laughs> so I'm uh, a lot of what has been what Garwin and Mike have presented uh, is basically the thinking that the department has pursued and we've done collaboratively as we work through this. Uh, in the department making its findings, it's the same process. You know, we're looking at consistency with the biological opinions and the construct of the biological opinions. And for long thin smelt, which we have an individual permit for for the state water project, we're looking at those same issues. So it's consistency or compliance with the permit. Mm -hmm. Uh, for long thin smelt, which hasn't been discussed at this point, mm -hmm. but is the other 
uh, pelagic species of concern, uh, you know, we know that there is a strong uh, flow abundance relationship. Uh, but in dry years like this and the preceding years, uh, you know, it's not unexpected that we're not going to see very good uh, reproduction and or s subsequent year classes. Uh, in tracking delta or long fin smelt this year, most of the distribution of this fish is in Sassoon Marsh and in the Sacramento River uh, with a smaller percentage in the lower San Joaquin. Mm -hmm. uh, we have documented. That's good, right? Yes. Uh, we have documented, though, through the small larval survey, that there has been spawning in the in the South Delta, uh, which is not unexpected. Uh, they tend to come farther into the system during drier periods, uh, and you know, so we're not surprised to see them. But the majority of larval fish caught have been in other portions of the Delta, and not. Uh, particularly within the influence of the projects given the operations and the kind of operations that have been taking place. And this was the same case last year that in many cases the department made no recommendations for long fin smelt because operations as they were were protective. Uh, in general, OMRs were low uh, and the distribution of fish was away uh, from that. Now, we'll be continuing to monitor that and particularly in light of the kind of ongoing operations that we're considering right now on a daily basi basis to look at what the operation should be in the question of the turbidity bridge and establishing that particularly as it relates to delta smelt, although long fin aren't as turbidity centric, let's mm -hmm. say. Uh, so, you know, for long fin, it's a, you know, not shaping up to be another again, not to be a good year. Uh, I think to the question of criteria, you know, the fish agencies in the department in particular as part of the uh, Reform Act language provided criteria and has provided input on the criteria from a biological perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I want to recognize the, you know, the hard work that the Water Board staff has done and the difficult task that faces them in assessing the reasonable use of water. You know, we're in an exceptional situation here, uh, as you've heard all day so far. Mm -hmm. uh, and the balancing and, the, you know, in a way the relatively small increments of water that we're talking about as to whether or not they're going to make an effect or not is very difficult, if not potentially impossible, to mm -hmm. judge, uh, you know, in these kinds of circumstances as opposed to under well, more. Well, it's all bad, pretty yeah, much. Yeah, under more uh, uh, normal si situations or in the criteria setting process. Uh, so uh, with that, I'll in my comments other than I think, you know, relative to the refuge water supply issues, you know, Mike touched on those. Uh, you know, we've been working closely with the Fish and Wildlife Service and the waterfowl community in general uh, on needs and assessing the impacts from last year. I think the uh, grasslands representative, you know, highlighted particularly the, the very bad situation that occurred south of the Delta and, you know, from that perspective, the ability to store some water in uh, San Luis allows for being better able to manage mm -hmm. know, wetland resources south of the Delta. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that, I'll leave it for comments. Questions? Commissioner Wilcox? I, I want to ask one other question, and then I want to ask if any of the staff have questions for you because, again, as, as Mr. Howard mentioned, part of this hearing is not just for us, it's also for them to hear from everyone and to hear um, from you all. It, it, we talked a lot in that chart, it, it was our chart, about the potential um, difference between approving your fully submitted 
petition versus the three quarters of it that Mr. Howard said yes to? Has anybody done a calculation of how much water is available or is conserved because of the approval of the first three? Have you estimated that? Or I may have missed it if we went through. Have you done that? We, we have not done that, um, although you could take a look at last year, I suppose, as a as one representative. Uh, so Right, because it was similar, but a little si different, It was right? similar, did not have, so it had everything but the half step. The other difference was we were asking for a uh, minimum of 3,000 rather than 4,000. We actually increased the minimum hmm. to 4,000, and that, that's kind of a lesson learned as okay. far as we didn't think 3,000 would cut it in terms of water quality. Uh, salinity oh, control. Okay. So uh, that's actually an increase in the requirement from what we requested last year. But I suppose you could take a look at um, last year's roughly 480 or 450,000 acre feet as mm -hmm. a savings of the request absent the midstep. That, so that's one example. That would of be course. or some proxy for it. F f right. I actually have a, a follow-up uh, question for Mr. Leahy. Yeah, sure. Um, because I think we might have discussed some different numbers about what we c are potentially saving through the approval already of not requiring the X2 requirement. Our estimate, and I think Tom referred to it, was a minimum of 10 days and up to about 20 days, so a range of about 70 to 180,000 acre feet, something like that. I think, uh, Mr. Leahy, you, you talked about only 10 days, zero to 10. Could you could you explain what what you think if uh, if you could just maybe restate what you think it might be, and and our assumption is that we're going to require 31 days uh, in March, but we'll have some carryover days from February. Yeah, so I think maybe one of the differences is in estimating what the actual Eight River Index uh, full natural flow will be for February, and um, I think it's possible. When you look at the table that, that describes how many days are necessary based on that previous month's ARI, uh, we are we're operating essentially between the zero. Well, I think it's a 15-day requirement and the 31-day requirement, and it's lin linearly interpolated. There's we're only halfway through the month, so I think there's a lot of uncertainty as how how that number will come in. I think if it remains dry, it's entirely possible that the full 31 days is not required for, for March. And so I think that's where our difference is, that um, it, it could, the requirement could be very much l less than 31 days. And the fact that we're accumulating carryover days this month, again, I, I think it's just highly variable. But I, I think as far as the number, the, the range of numbers that you came in with is is roughly close to that 100,000 acre feet. I mean, I, I really rounded my number off because of the uncertainty, but I think we're basically talking about in the, in the same neighborhood as far as the potential um, benefits. Great, and, and just to be clear, because it gets confusing fast, I was talking about the X2 part, and that seems to be something in the order of 100,000 acre feet, or, or we thought perhaps even higher. It depends, as you said, the number of days that are gonna be required but it's also about 100,000 acre feet as the theoretic maximum for the mid-range. So one way of looking at it then is that we've already approved 100 plus 1,000 acre feet mm -hmm. that's not required, and, and the mid-range we did not. They're about 100,000 acre feet each if, if conditions remain dry. Right, and, and like I said, the, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of uncertainty as far as how things can play out, but but roughly, that's that's what I showed on the slide. Was mm -hmm. uh, they were roughly both of those were about 100,000 acre feet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and then one final thing: by approving going below 7,100, that's going to be even more of a water savings on top of each of those 100,000 acre feet amounts. I was thinking the 100,000 was the piece below uh, 7,100. Well, there'd be, there's the difference between the mid-range and what we approved, but even just what we approved the 7,100 or even continue to pump at 1,500 when we're not meeting either the 7,100 or 5,500. And, and perhaps we don't need to get into an argument or a discussion of well, these it's details. Something to be figured it's out. something that we need to, we'll, we'll be working with them to see what okay. the numbers mean. Part of this is difficult because it's, it's 
based on a we number of things exactly that haven't happened. Happen. We don't know what right. it's going to be. Exactly. But I guess the key point is that part of what we've approved is striking a mid-range and that there's also, this is, if it doesn't rain, there's a significant quantity of water that we've already approved that is not going out the delta outflow. And right. we're talking about an additional quantity Correct. perhaps to be layered That's on That's why I was just trying to get the relative yep. measure. There are different things, uh, different interests interested in it, e et cetera. I was just trying to get a sense of the numbers since we've spent so much time today on what Mr. Howard did not approve as opposed to what he did approve. So I'm just trying to illuminate that uh, distinction. Or yeah. illuminate it, not and, eliminate and, it. And, and hopefully we did just a little bit, but it's complicated. A little and bit, but it yeah. bears a little mm -hmm. bit of focus. Well, thank you. I'm going to ask that you, um, we're going to take a five minute break and then we're going to resume with the next panel. I, I hope. I I'm sorry, but I, I do have a question yeah, sure. for this group um, sure. and want to take advantage of, uh, well, you know, your thinking around, while you're ahead. here. Um, I'd, I'd like to hear from you if, um, uh, because in the order, I think it's on page 19, Mr. Howard uh, raises concerns about monitoring and that it would be hard to tell what the impacts are because of the, uh, the hyacinth and maybe other concerns about oh, modeling so we haven't talked about the or monitoring. At all. Yeah, point. and so I'm wondering, uh, are, what, while you're here, are there any other protections that could be included as conditions um, uh, as part of the uh, tiered um, uh, export provision? So that's question number one. Question number two is, um, is there a different way to provide for um, increase in exports through a different approach instead of tiered, um, a ramping um, approach where it's a slow ramp? Would that make any difference um, one way or the other uh, with respect to uh, uh, the ability to provide additional protections? And that would be a question for them or for our staff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll go first on the second on the second question. You you could you could avoid that 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 in effect mid range stepwise effect, and and set it up so that you would actually split the difference if you were to drop below those thresholds of the seventy one hundred and the thirty five hundred exports. So rather than it being a jump to one and the other, they could just go down together. So if you recall, Mr. Lehigh's graphic that just showed the two alternatives where you either maintain at seventy one hundred and exports go down, or you have um, exports stay at 3,500 and delta outflow goes down, you could split the difference, which would be, you know, a trade-off of that trade-off. So that would be, you know, it would probably split the water supply cost. And let me know if that makes sense to you. Would that be a split the difference as in split the difference from an assessment of what's reasonable, or would it be a ramping that would have a different impact on the ecosystem? It's still going to be, and, and maybe this is just a point away, and, you know, a lot of what, what I heard from the fish agencies and, and what the, the OMR parts of it and the reverse flow parts of it, those are two separate but related things. We're talking about continued decreases in delta outflow. So though, you're, though what they uh, provide a concurrence on still has some OMR protections right. that are within what they've approved. Um, it all, I think everybody would have to agree, continues to result in further reduced delta outflow. <laughs> Everything that we've been doing results in further reduced delta outflow, what, what uh, uh, the executive director already approved, and then the tiered exports would be taking off even more. So if we just split that tiered exports to rather have a ramped exports, as you were uh, proposing, as there's some middle ground, well, that would be splitting the difference of that last piece, but it would still be, you know, so it would be splitting for that last piece, even more water supply benefit as opposed to uh, a deficit for ecosystem protection. And that there's that that reasonable imbalance that we're we're going to have to struggle with. Mm -hmm. But does that does that make sense, uh, John? Yeah, I think it'd be possible to, you know, propose any number of things. Um, I think if you look at the graphic, if you get an opportunity to look at the graphic that I did provide, um, at least uh, as the flows reside, you are seeing a ramping down of exports um, as we continue to. So, for example. We're at a uh, combined of uh, something over 5,000 um, export at this point. As the inflows just start to drop off, uh, once they hit the uh, 7,100 outflow, 
since we're above the 3,500 proposal, we would, we would have to continue to ramp our exports down to maintain 7,100 until we reach the point of the 3,500, and that's where we would hold it flat for a bit um, until the outflow drops to 5,500, and then you'd see a, a, an additional ramp down of exports. So there's, so there's sort of a, a ramping of exports that's, that's built yeah. into the proposal. Uh, I, I would say the, the other significance of picking the 3,500 export that we were the combination thereof is it, mm. it prevents any export above 35% EI ratio. Okay, and it was chosen. It was chosen. With there it. was there was some you know design behind it. Okay. Um, it also the achievement of the uh, of a 32 negative 3200 OMR splits the difference between the range and the OMRs between a minus 5000 and a minus 1250. So essentially, it's mid midpoint between those two. Um, the, the, the the range of OMRs that are possible under the biops, uh, the, mm -hmm. the 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 uh, Fish and Wildlife Service uh, biop. Um, and with the understanding that those OMRs could always be ratcheted further, um, further less negative, if if necessary. But I think you know we would certainly be open to um, to other variations thereof. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Five minute break, and then we'll resume with the panels. 